Uh, item number six is a very important item, the independent external review into systemic concerns relating to missing persons investigation. Uh, Mayor Torrey, this is your motion, so maybe I'll turn to you and ask you to kick it off. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, what I'll do is just make a few uh, introductory comments, and then, uh, and then we'll put the motion up and, and just go through that so that people understand it's been uh, distributed with the agenda materials and I think it's been uh, fairly widely reviewed over the last week or so. Uh, I think, uh, as people know, but I think it's worth remembering that there have been cases going back some considerable period of time, well uh, before even the present uh, troubling series of events that involve the disappearance of individuals, uh, including members of our LGBTQ uh, communities. And uh, that has created over time a, a, a series of uh, very troubling uh, questions. And so, um, you know, out of, I guess, a sense of humanity and sensitivity to the, and fairness to the family and friends of those people, but I think, uh, as importantly, um, in order to sort of make sure we can do our job of maintaining trust and confidence uh, in policing and in uh, the, the sort of overall system that uh, protects the public interest, um, it, this is one of those times in the public domain, and they arise all the time in the public domain, quite properly so, when an independent uh, external review is necessary to maintain uh, and in some cases to renew uh, trust and confidence. It's, it's just one of those opportunities that uh, arises and one of those uh, times when it is uh, appropriate and necessary to have somebody dispassionately answer what are often very difficult, uh, complicated questions, but somebody other than uh, the group that the questions are being asked about. Um, this board, in fact, exists here for that very purpose, to oversee uh, what is uh, what is a very difficult task that our police have, uh, police in whom are invested uh, very significant uh, special authorities and who have a very complicated uh, job to do. So um, the genesis of today's motion uh, is, uh, is uh, goes back, I guess, uh, to uh, a series of, of tragic and horrific events which have deeply affected all of us in Toronto, um, but including especially members of the LGBTQ uh, and, and the church in Wellesley's, Wellesley communities to name uh, two different sets of communities that uh, have been particularly deeply affected by this, but I think it's had an impact on many people, all people uh, across the city. If you go back, uh, the first thing that was done, and quite properly so by the chief of police, was that uh, he initiated an internal review. Uh, and that is something that is quite properly something he would do and, and, I, and, and does often on different kinds of things. Um, and the only thing that we have uh, requested with his full support uh, subsequent to that at the February meeting of this board was to ensure that the results of that public review, subject to uh, legal and other considerations that may prevent parts of it from being made public right away, is to have that uh, review report when it's available uh, made public so that the public can see um, what came out of that uh, review. Uh, and. Uh, Chief Saunders began at, at uh, much the same time as that uh, to explore with uh, the appropriate government authorities what could be done by way of a public inquiry uh, into the uh, particular uh, cases that are now uh, being investigated and will end up, I'm sure, in the judicial process at some point in time, just to explore something that I'll, I'll come back to as a very important point in all of this, which is that, that we have, as well as a responsibility to oversee we have, as the body that is going to initiate, I hope, uh, subject to the approval of, of colleagues today, this independent external review, an absolutely overriding responsibility as well uh, to protect the integrity of the ongoing investigations and to protect the integrity of judicial proceedings that will uh, flow from uh, those investigations so as to ensure that that can uh, unfold in a way that can be uh, not be affected by uh, things going on uh, elsewhere. And so, uh, so the next step uh, seemed to be, uh, and, and this has had, I should emphasize throughout, the full support of the Chief of the Police because he recognized uh, the need for an external independent review early on, uh, but uh, also had that same responsibility, which is our collective responsibility to make sure that nothing any of us did was going to jeopardize those investigations or those judicial proceedings. It doesn't mean that all the difficult questions don't get asked and answered, but it does uh, speak to the question of when. Uh, they might get answered and to some extent how uh, they get answered and that is probably where ultimately some other kind of inquiry will come in uh, to play uh, as well. Uh, subsequent to the February uh, meeting of the board when we did uh, uh, ask uh, that the independent review report be made public, I think it is fair to say that the list of, of unanswered and, 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 and very troubling questions that have caused a lot of anxiety uh, in the community has grown longer and so it, it uh, I think it, it, 
what what motivated me to put this motion forward again I would say with full support of the of the board chair and and the uh, chief has been to see what we could move forward with now uh, in order to begin the question of answering some of those difficult questions or just looking at ways in which we could do things uh, better so as to um, you know get some of that advice and have have some of that learning uh, as quickly as possible so uh, the way that we've tried to go about doing it in terms of at least the motion that's being put here today for consideration by the board um, is to ask uh, the chair of the board uh, to report to the uh, April 2018 meeting uh, on the composition of a working group. And some people may say, well, you know, why don't you just get on with it? Um, you know, why are you going to talk about a working group? Well, it's because the message that certainly I've received loud and clear, and I think my colleagues have as well, and others in, in public office who uh, have a lot of uh, uh, opportunity to interact with people in the, uh, in the communities that I made reference to, uh, understand that there is a deep desire not only to see some of the difficult questions answered, but to be consulted on uh, how we go about doing that. And so uh, we've chosen to, uh, to spend the next month uh, taking a look at the composition of a working group that will advise us, uh, the independent oversight board, uh, on the uh, composition and structure of the internal review, external review or reviews, because it could be that uh, it's recommended that there be uh, more than one. And we've said in the motion, uh, which is up there now or soon will be, um, that it, would, it should consist, at least the motion says this, of not more than four members, including a member of the board, as well as three external members. And again, uh, we wanted to make sure that we gave the communities uh, uh, that are most concerned about this, all of, the, all of the community, an opportunity to help us to identify the three external members. And so the chair is asked uh, by the motion uh, to consult the community, and in particular to uh, consult groups that um, may feel that when it comes to uh, the examination of missing persons investigations and some things that I'll get into in the second part of the motion, feel that uh, most, that have the greatest level of concern about this, that they should be consulted on both the, uh, the nature of the reviews and on the composition of this uh, working group. And that includes groups that are set out here, uh, organizations with work, which work with sex, sex workers, harm reduction and homeless populations, uh, groups representing Indigenous people in the LGBTQ communities, uh, including the Alliance for South Asian AIDS Prevention. And we have added to this uh, something that will not have been seen in the first iteration of the motion that was made public a few days ago, which is that uh, we think it will be very helpful in order to properly and effectively and completely achieve that uh, consultative uh, goal, uh, given uh, that the members of the working group you know, will, will need some assistance with this, that we can obtain uh, and will obtain a facilitator to help. Uh, with this task to make sure that this uh, consultative uh, uh, phase is carried out uh, effectively and, and completely. Uh, the second part you see right here, and there is one more change that I just draw your attention to from the originally circulated motion, is that the working group, uh, once constituted, will then uh, report to the Toronto Police Services Board at the June meeting, and that's moved it forward one month from May, simply to be realistic about saying, well, if you're going to meaningfully consult, if you're going to have the help of a, facil a facilitator, and you're going to uh, put the group together and get it to do some of its work, uh, uh, you know, in an effective manner and without being sort of rushed, uh, that uh, providing that period of time uh, is uh, something that is uh, important. And so if you then look at uh, uh, under uh, that item two, uh, I'll just briefly run through the parts of it, uh, what it's meant to do, the motion, is to uh, ask this working group to report to the board on first uh, part A there, the identification of the best possible form of an external review or reviews, including one commissioned by the board, uh, for example, and or uh, one that was conducted by an existing third party, such as uh, the Ontario Independent Police Review Director, OIPRD. And so it gives the committee the option of looking at those different uh, kinds of combinations or, or, or a single uh, kind of review and giving their advice with respect to what they thought would be uh, the most effective in the circumstances. And the circumstances really are presented by Part B. And it would then, uh, Part B would then have the working group also discuss uh, the possible terms of reference and make recommendations to the board in that regard and would include uh, the four things that are listed. First, uh, Toronto Police Services practices and actions relating to past missing persons investigations subject to any legal restrictions. And I'm going to emphasize some of these words that are in here because I think they're important in order to make sure that people understand um, uh, you know, the, the duty that all of us have uh, and uh, the restraints that will place on the first phase uh, of this work. 
A second, uh, Toronto Police Service Board policies, Toronto Police Service procedures, protocols, training, organizational structures relating to missing persons investigations. And then again, words that I'll draw your attention to, which will not include information or discussion of the MacArthur investigation and possible trial proceedings. And I understand the fact, uh, and I think most people that I've talked to in the community and as I've had various formal meetings, I've had a dozen groups into my office together with Councillor uh, Wong Tam uh, to discuss the deeply held concerns that exist about this in the community, that um, that is meant only to say that at this point in time, as we can begin the work at looking at some of the systemic issues related to missing persons investigations, we have to take great care. Um, in what we do and don't do in order to preserve the integrity of the investigations and the judicial proceedings. And so that's why those words are there, as are the words up at the top about uh, this being subject to any legal restrictions. And to some extent, um, the burden of this will fall more on the, the, the person or organization that is ultimately chosen as a result of this process to conduct this external third party review to assess the proper timing of when questions are asked and answered, um, more so than on the board or even on, on, on this committee. Uh, the third thing that I think is very important that we looked at here, and I've heard this uh, in my own uh, meetings uh, with the communities and, and uh, when I've been out in the community in, in recent uh, weeks and months, uh, any systemic concerns, especially those which relate to bias against people based on protect, protected grounds outlined in the in Ontario Human Rights Code. And that's as relates to missing persons investigations and policies and procedures and actions undertaken in respect to uh, to those. And then finally, a point that often I think we put into these sorts of things, but I think um, we underestimate the importance of it, which is the learning that we can take from people who do things well uh, elsewhere. Because we think we do things pretty well in Toronto, and I guess we do in many respects, but there's always somebody uh, who has a better idea that, that they've implemented as a result of some experiences of their own. Um, and so this uh, group would be asked to advise us on the inclusion in the terms of reference of, uh, of a consideration of national and international best practices into missing persons uh, investigations. I should say again, I think you, you will all have read the Chief's letter, which accompanies my own, and he may speak to this himself, um, which indicates there are some steps he's already taken inside the police uh, organization, as is his responsibility as Chief to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, consider uh, some changes that are made to how missing persons investigations are handled, but this investigation is uh, meant to look at, this internal, uh, external, external independent review is meant to look at, uh, uh, at, at, nonetheless, at how things are done elsewhere. And then finally, uh, just something that would uh, uh, be the proper domain of such a, uh, uh, of such a working group, which is to have a look at the anticipated costs of the review and timelines and, and make uh, recommendations uh, to, the, to this board in that regard. So that is the motion, Mr. Chair, and I will simply conclude by saying that um, I think, uh, yes, we have an obligation here to uh, work with the police service to make sure people are safe. Uh, we, we have an obligation to oversee what the police are doing, but most of all, I think our most important single responsibility is to make sure that we do our very best uh, as a board distinct from uh, the police service and, and, and in a position of oversight to maintain trust and confidence in uh, policing. And I think this beginning, and it is just a beginning, but it's a beginning that I think as far, is as far as we can go at this stage, but nonetheless a very important, very significant first step uh, to look at some things that have been lingering for some considerable period of time. Um, and that need addressing by an outside independent uh, reviewer. And uh, this will begin that process with, I guess, some decisions to be made uh, in the June meeting about exactly then uh, how that review will happen. But we'll be taking the time between now and June uh, to consult the community, which I think is also very important, and to try to do this in a very thoughtful uh, way, uh, commensurate with uh, the importance of the issue to large segments of the community. Thank you, Mayor Torrey. And, um there are a number of deputations, but before we get to that, uh, Chief Saunders, is there any uh, comments you wish to make uh, for your submission? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And first and foremost, I want to say that uh, I support the motion brought by forward by Mayor Tory. I believe the public interest and the best interest of the Toronto Police Service will be well served by an independent external review to report publicly on issues related to missing persons. For Toronto's LGBTQ community, this has been a very difficult time, and I know that many are very upset, and many are still grieving, and they have many questions about what happened and what could have been done differently. I take these questions seriously, and I hope that my actions demonstrate that conviction. 
So far, I've taken a number of steps in responding, including to, as you have addressed, uh, Mr. Mayor, um, ordering the professional standards to review in the uh, cases of uh, Tess Ritchie and Laura Wells. Uh, second, I've had uh, Deputy Chief Barb McLean and LGBTQ liaison officer Danielle Botno. Uh, they've been reaching out in the community, as have I, meeting with groups and taking the time to listen more carefully. And I have also initiated plans to create a dedicated missing persons unit within the Toronto Police Service. And its mandate will be to review all outstanding cases and consider whether our existing procedures and training are appropriate and effective. I'd finally like to reassure the board that it has the support and active participation of the command team as well as the uh, Toronto Police Service as we move forward uh, with this review. Thank you, Chief Saunders. Uh, as I said, there are a number of uh, deputations. Um, the first one, uh, Brian Demetis. Brian, you know the rule of five minutes, and I'll give you a one minute warning. Yep. Yep. To speak on the item of missing and murdered members of the LGBTQI communities. Before I get in the heart of the review, I need to point out three extremely problematic issues regarding the agenda item from members of this board. I am very angered, full of rage, and sadness for not only losing friends, but how they were lost and how they continue to be victimized time and time again, even in their deaths. One by our own chief, who had the need to take a public relations stance and had a need to take a public relations stance. And victim blame not only the LGBT community as a whole, but victims of rape and physical assault themselves, blaming us for not coming forward and for the mayor to support this victim blaming so the police can look innocent in all this. You are not innocent in any of this. Irrelevant on what you meant, it was, as it always should be, about addressing the impact of your own words and actions, not your intent. This is what should have happened but did not. Yet again, another dire reminder of how folks in power and police avoid accountability to community and my friends. So I say this, shame on you both. Now how my communities are dead but still being victimized in the hands of the police include friends like Dean Lewiska, who are who you, as police, had the disgusting procedure not to, to release his mugshot as if him, the victim, was the criminal. How dare you? Why did you not ask his friends or family for a respectable picture for, of him? Imagine his family having to open the newspaper to find this out. Just imagine that. I say in anger and rage and sadness, shame on you. Now the third point I need to make in regards to the pattern of brutality my community and friends must continue to endure by members of this board is again from John Tory to use our the LGBTQ community ideas and policies and advocacy around police accountability to make his own words take full credit in the media and even on this agenda. Yes, you did give us a small paragraph in the end and submitted a letter that recognized us. Thank you for that small print, but again, I say sadness and rage, shame on you, Mayor Tory. Now on the purpose of this agenda item, there has been a clear, as it always been in the police force, a dangerous and deadly lack of cultural competence of my communities, the LGBTQI communities, in police policy and everyday standard operating procedure that in no doubt in my mind contribute daily to the historical and present homo transphobia transphobic brutality we face from Toronto Police Services. There is extremely, extreme amounts of change that needs to happen regarding the case of Project Houston to the McCarthy cases to the policies and procedures that kill many members of my community. This review, if it has any chance of delivering meaningful results, it must expand more than just the case of missing persons, but how police force treat folks who are queer, trans, and two-spirited, who are also racialized, homeless, in sex work, those with substance use, and impacted by mental health, because all that does impact my community. This should, not, this should and must include policy and procedure on how police treat trans folks every day. The common officer and most of all the members of this board cannot tell the difference or even know the definitions and or difference between transgender, transsexual, intersex, two-spirited, non-binder, gender, queer. 
do you, should we, the procedure and policy for police is that when an officer arrests one of my community members who identifies under a different identity than cisgender, it is up to the individual police officer to determine what jail they should go to. On average, they get it wrong because their training and their manual is wrong. And to make matters worse, the only option police folks have on protecting quote unquote non cisgender members of our community is to put them in solitary confinement. Even when they're put on the wrong jail or the right jail but are attacked for being non cisgendered, this is written in the pol police training manual. Again, we see systematic transphobia that my community must endure. That is cruel, it is disgusting, it is punishment while being punished just for being who you are. Oh, how my community knows that experience. For this review to work, you must go beyond the regular practice, practices the, that reviews have with regards to misconduct of the TBS. You must examine everyday brutality that is practiced by the Toronto Police Force. You must add not only members of the government, but extensive outreach and participation from members of my community. And I'm not just talking about the rich, white, cis guys, gays, you hire and tokenize to pinkwash your way out of bloody hands. I'm talking about getting LGBT folks who have lived ex experiences in jail system and police brutality. I'm also talking about members of my community who are queer and trans people of color who have lived experience of mental health and addiction and sex work. This review will mean nothing unless we incorporate the principles of intersectionality and in how we deal with the most diverse community in the world. I repeat this again, no change will happen until the most vulnerable and marginalized members of my community have our voices centered, centered here, centered in the review, and voices centered in training of officers, the manual, and policies of Toronto Police. Until that step has been taken, all you're doing is pinkwashing excuses to justify your brutality to vulnerable populations. Thank you, Brian. Am I out of time? Uh, yes, you were. Uh, sorry, I was holding up a minute ago. The the one finger. Um, colleagues, questions, Shelley? Yes, th thanks, Brian. So, Brian, um, I don't know if you came uh, seeing the content of the motion. I did. Um, but uh, uh, so, Mayor Tory has added, I think a lot of people in the community had the idea that it was just going to be about um, looking at missing persons procedures. But Mayor Tory has now added, and any systemic concerns, especially those related to bias against yep. people on protected grounds. So, within that clause, if this, if what we get back in June is that this inquiry is going to leave a lot of room to explore that, will that help us uh, deal with the issues that, that you've presented today? No, because historically you chose members who are usually compliant with the police, usually white cis folks or folks that are privileged in our community. What I'm saying for this to work, you have to outreach to folks that are not regularly seen, not the regular folks that are usually going to be up here speaking not the regular folks that have the privilege. You need to outreach to the most marginalized of, within my community, folks impoverished, folks racialized folks, trans folks, two-spirited folks, folks that ha are mo most impacted by the brutality of police. This is just not gonna work. It's just gonna be pinkwashing. It's just gonna be tokenizing its way out of to a good PR campaign, you must consult all community members, not the ones that Kristen Wong Tam comes up here with, but folks that are not regularly asked. Those voices right. need to be centered, or else this is just going to be another. We, we have to add that in, is what you're saying. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, colleagues, any other questions? Brian, thank you. Uh, next is. Uh, Next, would, would, could you put that down, please? Uh, next, uh, Shakir Rahim and uh, Mr. Rahim, thank you very much for uh, coming forward. And uh, for you've uh, provided us a written deputation, so we thank you for that as well. My pleasure. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, okay, let's be, stay close to the mic. <laughs> uh, good afternoon. My name is Shakir Rahim, and I'm a board member of the Alliance for South Asian AIDS Prevention, as well as a gay South Asian man who lives with both a mental and physical chronic health condition. Also in attendance today is our executive director, Haran Vijayanathan. 
ASAP is here with the support of 30 diverse community organizations and community leaders. Today I will tell you about our advocacy and positions on the review process. ASAP was founded 29 years ago by a group of activists because HIV positive South Asians could not locate culturally competent care. We are the only LGBTQ non-governmental organization that specifically serves the South Asian and Middle Eastern communities in Ontario. Our community and others have been alarmed about the pattern of disappearances of South Asian, Middle Eastern, and LGBTQ persons. We are alarmed at how long it took for an alleged perpetrator to be arrested. We are alarmed at reports that proper investigative steps may not have been followed. And we are alarmed at the complexity of some of our community members' lives may have led to erroneous conclusions about why they could not be found. And we know that systemic issues, including bias, underlie our concerns. It is bias that is conscious and unconscious, individual and structural. The result of our concerns has been a crisis in public trust between our community and the Toronto Police. A lack of public trust compromises effective policing, participation in the criminal justice system, and most importantly, the safety of the public. In January, to begin the process of rebuilding that trust, we called for external accountability of the Toronto Police and constructive dialogue with them. We have worked hard to deliver both of these objectives since January, working with the mayor and his policy team and meeting with the leadership of the Toronto Police Service. While we support this motion, we would like to make our position clear on three issues. First, our request is and has always been for the board to commission the independent review into how the TPS conducts missing person investigations. As the recently passed Safer Ontario Act makes clear, and Mayor Tory, as you made clear in your opening statements here today, the board is responsible for providing adequate and effective policing in its area of policing responsibility. The Morden Report into the G20 Summit, commissioned by this board, emphasized the importance of the board effectively and actively exercising that oversight function. We support other reviews and inquiries, but they should supplement, not replace, a board commissioned process. Our second position is that it is essential that the community is involved throughout the entire process of establishing any review. The working group that this motion creates cannot be the end of the community's role but rather the beginning. The formulation of the final terms of reference for any review must include direct community involvement. And that includes the meetings with the lawyers, with policy staff, and so forth, that often characterize the technical details of how these reviews come into being. And that should also include the new addition to this motion of the selection of a facilitator. That facilitator should only be chosen with the full agreement of the working group that this motion strikes. Third, we recognize that the review cannot compromise the investigation of criminal proceedings of Bruce MacArthur. Keeping that in mind, however, a systemic review still ought to consider any prior missing person investigations within appropriate legal boundaries. In closing, our hope is that at the end of this process, we are closer to a reality where every member of our public truly feels that their life is treated with the same respect and care as any other. Because today, in this city, that is not the case.
Thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Rahim. Um, thank you for coming, and thank you for the, uh, the presentation. Colleagues, questions? Uh, Ms. Chandra Kassara? Thank you, and thank you for your statement. My question to you is, what is the scope that, you, that ASAP would like to see as part of this review? So our position is that the, the, the central purpose of the review is to examine missing person investigations with a focus on the LGBTQ community. But as the prior deputant, I think, rightfully made clear, you cannot answer that question without looking at the broader systemic considerations. And so we expect that to be part of the process. Uh, at the same time, what we recognize, and I think what the history of independent reviews has emphasized, including the current ongoing uh, national inquiry into missing uh, Indigenous women, is that a review has to have a certain focus and scope. So absolutely, that would be our approach. But most importantly, the fact that this review is happening does not mean that there should not be other steps taken. I think Kristen Wong Tam's written deputation spoke about uh, a real history between the police and the community uh, with respect to tension and bias. Um, and so I think this motion is perhaps a starting point uh, about a broader conversation and set of examinations uh, that are necessary. Any other questions, colleagues? Thank you very much. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Susan Gapka. Thank you, Susan. You know, the, the, I'll give you five minutes and I'll give you a one minute warning. Okay, I'm going to uh, start my timer. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Susan Gapka, S-U-S-A-N, Gapka, G-A-P-K-A. -A. Oh, yeah, I've been doing that all day. Um, I'm here with the Toronto's Missing, Murdered, Rainbow community members, and I've been listening to deliberations. In the last couple of weeks, uh, um, Greg Downer, who started, um, was looking for his friend and ended up in this unprecedented series of events where we've got now an alleged serial killer in custody. Um, we've had a lot of violence in our communities. Um, and so they asked me to help out with, uh, we had a media release this morning. We're asking for a public inquiry and sooner rather than later. We're concerned about the political landscape. We may have the Attorney General um, is actually the one. So I realize that's out of scope, but that's what kind of got me up at 6 o'clock this morning um, to talk about. But um, what I was brought into the group, I think, to help with, not only Greg Downer and uh, other people, is to bring in my relation. I have a around diversity, uh, a former homeless kid, um, it's just some of the things around some of the disadvantage around some of the people that were uh, found uh, um, murdered, um, uh, missing and murdered, and some of that. So, and I realize, so we really want to impress upon you the sense of urgency, but understanding I don't have a vote at this table. So I've actually written a recommendation while I've been listening and learning, because I've learned a lot about this thing that I didn't know a lot about, and I'm pr I'm 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 here reluctantly today um, but I'm rec uh, this is my own I just want to um, remind people I'm an individual I'm a community member I've been uh, I've worked with the police on and off uh, I'm a member of the CPLC in 51 division that was us <laughs> who asked about the previous agenda item um, and um, I've been I helped uh, form I was one of the founders of the chief's consultative committee um, in 2000, un being unaware of the long history between the, LG the uh, gay community and, 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 and our communities, but public policy, I was there. But, um, but what I'm seeing here um, is I'm feeling some of our most disadvantaged people may be left out. 
great to see sex workers and homeless people and I don't know if I saw trans people, but there's a lot of people that are falling through the cracks in a society where there's becoming more and more division between those who have and those who do not, who end up in our parks. So I'm recommending that the Toronto Police Service, in partnership with the City of Toronto City Manager and the soon-to-be constituted LGBTQ. 2S, I believe, are the um, advisory committee to develop a parallel consultation process to develop mechanisms and communications which will work towards improving the public trust and community safety of our rainbow communities and the Toronto Police Service. I feel that there's been moments in time, there was the bathhouse raids which uh, preceded my coming out experience. There was the Pussy Palace that happened when I was, we were developing the Chief's Consultative Committee. Um, there, um, um, the G20 experience, which was uh, another schism, and now this. So we have a lot of work to do, and in that regard, around working with the community members who will otherwise be left out of this process. For example, we, well, not all of us, if you had a badge, you didn't have to undergo security uh, at the front desk. But things like having meetings at police headquarters make a number of us feel uncomfortable. I meant, I want, and you haven't seen me here in a while, right? I, I, if I have a, uh, so, you know, better relations in the community. And I'm glad to see that the chief has appointed um, deputy chief, Barbara McLean and Danielle to work on those, uh, Botno to work on those relationships. I do have a good working relationship with her. So I just look and I think we're almost at time, but we need to do better and we need this inquiry sooner rather than later. There are questions that we want to see answered and I think we are building consensus that I, I think many of us in this room are looking for what happened, what went wrong, how can we do better next time? Susan, thank you very much. Uh, colleagues, uh, Councillor Carroll? Yes, uh, thank you, Susan, as always. Um, first things first, let's get this out of the way. Can you, do you want to reread your recommendation to me again? I was trying to write it down as yes. fast as possible. We got, you, you sped up at the end. <laughs> Just read it out to it me It was again. like a one-minute warning, you know. <laughs> it's like if I could only do that when I was running a half marathon, I'd be great. <laughs> uh, sorry. So, oh, yeah, just so read it out recommending, yeah. if that's okay with the chair, I can send it to someone. Um, the Toronto Police Service, in partnership with the City of Toronto's city manager and soon to be constituted LGBTQ2S Advisory Committee develop a parallel consultation process. That was it. To develop mechanisms and communications which will improve the public trust and community safety between our rainbow communities and the toronto police service there is so much more i could have written on this but i realize you have a packed agenda yeah. but and so this is i think to enhance those for me the feeling is not everyone's going to be part of this process mm -hmm. but a lot of us have a lot of questions we're a community in grieving and uh i think yeah. we want to be active and engaged in uh helping all of us find some answers right so it would be good if you could email that because it's a little more, uh, uh, it's longer than, than, than I would get written down here, but I think we should look at it. I'm Thank not you. sure, I'm not sure whether or not it fits today or it should be transmitted to the steering uh, uh, group that will set up this uh, inquiry and bring the turns back in June, but, but we can consult with the mayor on that. I just wanted to ask you one other question. Um, uh, I, you've been, you have been away for a while from uh, Police Board Matters, so you may not realize that, in fact, we are discussing 
this uh, uh, police board meeting, the monthly meeting, moving outside of police headquarters, because it's actually been recommended mm -hmm. um, in uh, in other uh, inquiries. Uh, we we have we've had that recommendation from Justice Tullock and others. So there is a move towards getting out of uh, police headquarters. Uh, uh, is this? I, I think I think you think strategically. You're you're very much a policy wonk like me. But is that? Is that out there in the community? Is there is there a lot of talk in the community about they need to get out of that building? I think there's an emerging discussion about security even at City Hall and in public buildings like this that make a lot of us feel uncomfortable. And if we have, we have broken, I don't know what the word is, I want to find my kind person here. Um, yeah. uh, just a more generous person, but you know, relationships are strained at this time, which makes yes. it even more difficult. I, um, when we formed the <laughs> consultative committee, it terms a reference um, that we would meet in community organizations, um, that people would be um, elected at town hall meetings, um, that uh, and uh, that the public uh, there'd be like so in the original recommendations in here, which I will leave behind, um, is that there should be at least a town hall every six months. Um, so because we do have a lot to vent, and it will be uncomfortable and ugly and that. But we need to get that out. Uh, sometimes people will need to get that out before we can start. T listening to each other and that's just part of the process of public consultation as well yes fantastic thank, thank you thanks susan. thank you susan uh ken you had a question yeah you mentioned a number of initiatives that have taken place in the past right and i'm mm -hmm. familiar i think with most of them what would make this suggest the, the this initiative different with, with to get different results because obviously mm -hmm. it didn't they didn't work and it sounds like it didn't work, right? So with your um, familiarity and experience with this, what is, are there some things that you want to see that's going to be not the same old? I think this is an opportunity, actually. Uh, this is a traumatic set of circumstances that brings me to go through security downstairs, uh, but brings us here. Um, but uh, if we turn that into an opportunity to have more connections, there is a undercurrent of criminalization, homosexuality, transsexuality. Many of us have been criminalized in the past, so there's that long residual history around that. And so there's some members of our communities who would never think the police can't change. I'm of the view that you can change. I don't quite trust you. I gotta say, <laughs> I don't quite trust you. I'm a reluctant participant, but we need to, uh, but it's my view that building bridges works much better to having that common communication. There are a lot of people for whatever reasons um, that are not able to come to report, like community-based reporting if you've been violated, if you've been abused, if you feel a crime has been committed of you. And in some of the news that has come out on this investigation, um, or not maybe the investigation, but in some of the media reports, people have said, there's a serial killer. People have said, I've been attacked, and they were not believed. And that's a tremendous schism that we need to work on doing, uh, improving that public trust on. Again, Susan, thank you very much uh, for coming here and uh, for your honesty and putting that forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your you time. And if you that motion to Ms. Bennett, that would be phenomenal. Um, Should I? Is yep. uh, Brenda Ross, uh, Brenda, you're next. Do you need some help? Officer, could you help uh, Ms. Ross, please? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't want to sit down. Oh, okay. Thank you. Do you want me to move this over here? Yes, please, I do. Thank you.
Brenda, thank you for coming. You know the rules of five minutes, and I'll give you a one-minute warning. Yeah. A couple of days ago, the Toronto Sun printed something that they call a meaning of a term, dumpster fire. This is the meaning that they printed in the newspaper. An utterly calamitous or mismanaged situation or occurrence. And that's what we have. One tragedy after another, and we're still speaking about the same things. Nothing's changed. And thank you to Greg Watt and Miss Charlene, who have just told us something that I wanted to bring up. Cultural Change Report is going to be in at the end of the month. I look forward to seeing it. I can't wait. I believe that cultural change should be pushed right up to the forefront of the way forward. That is part of the problem. Certain people or groups of people are deemed by the police not to be worthy of service or protection. Inquiries and special units will not change an attitude. Inherent disrespect, lack of concern for certain members of society has resulted in numerous tragedies. We had a couple of ladies here last month who told us, treat others as you would like to be treated. But that cannot be just words that we hear when we come to the police board meetings. All lives matter. But the police force does not reflect that belief. Actions are everything. Actions, not words. Gloria from Human Resources told us months ago, it will take years for the TPS to reflect the core values that the way forward would like everyone to do. But clearly, we can't wait for 20 years to go by before we see success. No one at this table is going to still be here in 20 years. What would happen, ladies and gentlemen, if you were told by people from Rosedale that six or seven people had gone missing? Would the police be lackadaisical and responding, responding excuse me, to the fact that six or seven people were missing in Rosedale? Would there have been suggestions that it was their imagination? Suggestions that they're suffering from paranoia and not suggesting something sinister was going on. The police are guilty of willful blindness and failure to serve and protect. Yeah. Yeah. Our police chief has to now stand up. Our police chief, our new police chief, Chief Mark Sanders, has to stand up and take a leadership role, not telling us about some new unit, because the un new unit is just going to repeat what we already have wrong. Yeah. It's not going to change anything. It's just going to be that we're going to tell each other we have a new unit. This should be viewed as criminal acts. When the police do not do their duty, the police officers guilty of not doing their duty should be viewed as criminals. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to the long list of those not served that I've repeated over and over again, the poor, the homeless, the mentally ill, the crippled, the handicapped, aboriginals, elderly, blacks, homosexuals, not worthy of police service and indeed have been encouraged. The police themselves are encouraged to think they're different from society and they have the attitude they're not the same as the rest of society, and I've spoken about that several times and been ignored and laughed at. I'm sick of being laughed at, I'm sick of being called names, and I'm sick of being ignored, especially after the recent events of the last few weeks. I would like the police to stop with this encouragement of the police having cliques, of the police not demonstrating their empathy for society because they're not part of society. Could we please move forward the cultural change right up to the top of the list and put that at the top of the list and everything else after it, every single thing else? Thank you for your time. Brenda, thank you. Colleagues, uh, questions of Ms. Ross? Brenda, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Becky McFarlane, who is the uh, Senior Director of Program and Services at the 519. Becky, thank you for coming. Uh, I'll give you five minutes and I'll give you a one minute warning. Great. Thanks. Uh, so the 519 uh, has already submitted a, a written 
uh, submission. I just wanted to highlight three important things from, I think, from our perspective. Uh, the first, and I'm reiterating a lot of what I think some of the former uh, speakers have said, the first that this, uh, the establishment of this external working group, which will establish, I think, another external review or reviews or groups, uh, the notion that it's representative of the experiences and knowledge of those most vulnerable in our communities. Uh, I think that's a critical point. I'd like to add uh, to that, uh, and again, re reiterating racialized communities, trans communities, sex workers, homeless communities, that also uh, whomever is engaged in that work and whomever is invited to participate uh, in those conversations from a leadership uh, point of view are compensated for their time. Uh, I think it is incredibly important when you're inviting people to participate in processes uh, where they're attempting to fix problems that aren't really of their own making, uh, that their experience is valued, uh, and that they're compensated for their time. So that was the first point I wanted to make. Um, I think that remembering that this, uh, this particular situation we're talking about doesn't exist in a vacuum, and that the way in which uh, we need to approach uh, the development of terms of reference for this review should not be ahistorical in the way in which it thinks about these problems sort of broadly. I had the opportunity to talk to Jane Doe, who reached out to the 519 in the hopes of being able to share some of her experiences going through um, a very long process uh, on issues that are stunningly similar in relation to issues of the duty to warn, of issues of bias within uh, the Toronto Police Service. And what came out of that conversation for me um, was that it took 20 years to get to the point where the committee that was contemplating a lot of the uh, recommendations uh, an implementation plan for everything that came through that process was disbanded. And I have to say that there is no way that this community can wait 20 years through whatever external review processes and in inquiries are established to try to understand what I think has been understood in a million inquiries, in a million external reviews, in a million mechanisms that have existed historically. We need to draw on that information and we need to figure out how to cut our timelines a little bit in terms of how we engage in this kind of process. Because um, I don't think anybody really feels like they have 20 years to invest to invest in this. And I fear that if that isn't kind of established up front, um, which leads me to, to saying I think that what is missing from this particular motion uh, is the notion of how to make what comes out of these processes actionable and accountable to some kind of timelines. Because uh, I think what we don't want is a scenario where we get to the end of a process and then have to have a conversation about how we action what we learn through that process. Um, uh, and I guess, you know, I mean, <laughs> It's so hard to imagine that the grief, so much of the grief that exists in the community is preventable. The grief that people experience now, preventable. The, ex the grief that people are going to experience into the future, preventable. We know that we don't even know everything, right? And we know that there is going to be more grief. We also know, because I work in an organization where people come to us all the time, either afraid to report issues of violence that they experience in the community uh, or try to report and often their experiences are incredibly negative. So what we know is even as we sit here today, people are going through those systemic issues we're attempting to solve, people are continuing to experience those, uh, those barriers, that, that the, the, the uh, lack of access to justice. And so if there is, there's nothing that feels more imperative to me than, than figuring out a way to move through this quickly. And one last point I wanted to make, just because it's important to me, is there is a way in which even still, through this conversation, uh, people conflate humanity with lifestyle. And I think that this notion of how we talk about our, ex how people talk about our experiences, how we talk about each other's experiences, are relegated to this notion of the choices that we make or the behavior we engage in as opposed to being able to understand 
that what is going on all around us is about people's humanity and a lack of understanding of people's right to be who they are. Uh, and so even how I, how I hear people talking, what gets stuck in people's throats, the way that people can't even talk about queer and trans lives in a way that feels empowering, that I really think everyone at this table needs to think about the ways in which they feel uncomfortable about having this conversation and check that as they move forward trying to lead us uh, through a process where we do not find ourselves sitting here in 20 years having the same conversation. Becky, thank you very much. That's very well done, very powerful, and thank you. We appreciate it. Uh, Colleagues, questions of, of Becky? Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I draw your attention, colleagues, to Kristen Wontam, uh, Councillor Kristen Wontam's uh, uh, presentation as well. Um, and um, uh, so, colleagues, I now throw it open to uh, question, debate, discussion. Councillor Carroll. Um, yes, I, I think I think probably staff can draw something up, and I, I whispered in the mayor's ear that uh, the the idea that probably the best way to deal with Susan Gapka's uh, suggestion of a recommendation is just take the whole thing and forward it to this body that's reporting back in June so that they could just incorporate it in the terms of reference. If you were going to do that partnership consultation, how would you do it? Just incorporate it so it comes back. Um, with uh, with uh, the actions that are recommended, um, and and uh, and then we can uh, vote on doing that today and and be assured of that. Um, the I just want to say that uh, uh, the last deputy I think really put the nail on the head. Uh, there is going to be a lot of cynicism surrounding this if we don't acknowledge that we've already had this conversation so many times. Um, there is uh, there's an old quote uh, uh, when we when we were a bunch of activist moms being getting ready to be activists about education uh, back when uh, uh, we all went and sat with the quite aged Ursula Franklin in her little salon she had in the school and uh, um, we all talked about how awful it was going to be and how terrible all of this was and and she said to us uh, she let us go for about an hour and then said okay when you're done awfulizing. What are you going to do? And I've I've never I've never gotten over that word awfulizing. We have a tendency to call a consultation, and we we can be because it's consultation night, very respectful in terms of letting people vent, and then what we're hearing is that nothing happens afterwards, or we make recommendations and then we get a report that says tick a box we did them. But clearly we didn't if nothing feels any different outside on the ground. Um, and I hate to say this, uh, it will probably flare things up and people will be upset, but this is essentially what happened with PACER. You know, nothing feels any different in many, many communities, and yet we got a report saying of all those PACER recommendations, I think they're 28, 29, two-thirds of them are done. Tick a box, they're all done. And if that is the case, why are we still talking about anti-black racism in policing? So I think it is going to be really, really important um, to come out of this with recommendations. But I think the rush part that they're asking for is let's rush past the awfulizing and really start talking about the actions we need to see. And then the part where we're going to need to take the, the more meaningful amount of time and get real is the action part. And, and so, you know, we can wait till June to find the terms of reference, but the terms of reference shouldn't include just awfulizing for three years while people continue to feel they're being criminalized for, for, for who they are. Um, and, then, uh, uh, and then the action part, that should be the part that takes three years because we should see real change. Thank you, those are my comments. Uh, colleagues, uh, can you first, and then uh, yes. Um, the, the what we've been hearing a, a lot of here is the the repetition of initiatives, and that's one of my concerns um, about what were the barriers, and what are the barriers that that make it um, so difficult for sustaining any kind of change. Um, I would like to us to explore that. With, with this review committee. However, uh, I directly to the chief, uh, a question to you as well. 
the in this review committee, um, there would be opportunities for um, communities to understand investigative procedures and what have you. I'm particularly also sensitive to the fact that you may have some techniques, and you meaning the police, that that um, shouldn't be disclosed, in, so that it, you, in terms of investigative um, initiatives that you take, right, so that others would know what to try and avoid for those who have really, you know, bad intentions. So how is, is there differentiation with the techniques of investigation and the relationship with the, the with communities like the LGBTQ community and others that, um, that, that are not happening, you know? Are there two, are, are they two, is it, are they two separate or two, you know, explain to me how that can work. I'm not quite sure if the question I, I can I can conclude with that uh, uh, as an organization we, we want to get this right and we understand what the issues and the concerns are so um, I don't want us to come across as obstructionists I, I want that open opportunity to hear what needs to be heard so that we can move forward uh, with respect to procedure policies that we don't generally put them on the table and we don't give the playbook of things we're supposed to do but we do listen and if there are things that we need to add on and if we do have the right um, um, groups in front of us to have that conversation to help us improve on what we're doing, um, that will be an active role that we will definitely be a participant of. So I, I, maybe a little bit more specific. In terms of um, what is requested of us here to have this review body, I'm just trying to understand. Um, you know, I'm hearing loud and clear the, the understanding and, uh, of the LGBT community in this case around you know, um, the, the relations are not very good, right? I'm hearing that. Uh, that's one is major issue. The other I'm asking about is that when, you know, people are not happy about the way in which it was investigated, they are, I'm saying that there, I was suggesting that there are techniques that you use that you may want to, not, not the whole, all the public, to you know how you're going to reconcile that. That's, that's, I mean, I, I hope the chair can correct me, but I'm, I'm hoping that the terms of reference will be taking these aspects into consideration so that um, when that does present itself, we have the right answers and everybody at the front uh, of the conversation knows exactly what the expectations are and what our involvement and our, what our role will be. Yes, I agree. Um, any other follow up, Ken? Is it okay? Uh, any other questions um, or comments? Uh, Ms. Senator Casera, you had? Thank you. Mine's more a comment and just thinking through what's been shared here. And repeatedly over and over what we're hearing is that the community does not feel heard on this issue. Uh, the issue of bias has come forward several times from the deputant. And I was happy to see that in Mayor Tory's motion. I think bias is conscious and unconscious. We're not <laughs> sometimes even aware that it's happening. So one of the things that I think that we can't forget in this review is, is this concept of <coughs> intersectionality, because there's so many overlapping issues that are happening here, um, especially when we think about what's been shared to date on, uh, from these communities about their concerns. So what I'd like to really see happen is how we're going to consult the, the LGBT community, especially in the forming of this, the scope of this review. And for us to think about, do we hold a consultation before that scope is finalized? And whether it's, you know, you have this smaller group, which is, you know, four members coming together to draft something. But I think it, it is in the interest of the public for us to have something more public where people can give us concrete um, input into what the scope should be because it, it's very broad. There's systemic pieces, it's interpersonal, structural, organizational, um, and then let's not forget what Susan Gapka mentioned, which is that there's a, lost, a lot of trusted, uh, mistrust in the community. So if there's some way that we can make that, as we're determining the scope, if that part could be more open, um, that could also be a starting point to rebuilding that trust with that community as well. One final comment uh, yes, around this. Um, yep. The OHRC, the Ontario Human Rights Commission, um, is, there, is there a role that for, for, for them to be 
playing in all of this because I'm sometimes uh, amazed that the OHRC is not with its different levels of expertise and so forth. Uh, not, not, they are not an integral part of human rights concerns and, 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 and questions, you know? Um, you know, uh, 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 we will be looking to uh, get input from the community. I'm charged with coming back with uh, the makeup of, of, a, of, of a, a working group uh, to go forward. So I would hope to hear from the Human Rights Commission, but if you recommend we should reach out to them, uh, that's, that's something we can do. To recommend that the Human Rights Commission be involved okay. an integral part of, of, of this whole review as well. Uh, any other suggestions? Any other comments, colleagues? Mayor Tory, anything you wish to, before we vote on these and no, uh, receive the two I, I think we've learned quite a bit, and, yeah. and I think uh, uh, comments just made about, uh, you know, finding ways to make sure we, we broaden out the consultation, I think, respond to some of what we heard from the deputants, and I think part of what the working group will look at is whether organizations like the Human Rights Commission can play a role. That's precisely what they're looking at, which is who should, who should do this uh, and how, what it should do and so forth. So I think it's been a good discussion and very helpful. Okay, so with that, then, if there's no more comments or questions, uh, we need a couple of uh, resolutions. One, uh, 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 motion to receive uh, 6.1, uh, which is the, the Chief's, uh, Councillor Carroll, seconded, Ms. Molnar, all in favour. Second, a motion to receive the deputations that we had. Um, uh, Councillor Carroll seconded uh, Ms. Mulner again. All in favor? Any contrary? And finally, the motion to approve the uh, uh, resolution put forward by the mayor. Is it uh, referring to uh, uh, yeah, Yes. We, well, with the, with the addition, as, as Councillor Carroll uh, said, that we will add in the reference to uh, Ms. Kupka's uh, uh, suggestion referred to the committee once it's struck. Uh, so a motion to uh, approve Mayor, Mayor Tories moving it, seconded by Councillor Lee. All in favor? Any contrary? Carried unanimously. Thank you.